Mind mapping will let you study five times faster and allow you to know content so well that you can answer any question you get asked and remember what you studied forever. Learning how to mind map properly was one of the study techniques that allowed me to go from struggling to get 65% on my exams to getting 95% and winning an award in medical school, all while working on this YouTube channel being a student leader and having a life outside of medicine. In this video, I'll explain how mind mapping can change your life in medical school and show you step-by-step step how you can start using this today. It all starts by understanding the fundamental principles that will let you learn anything. These are so, so important because they apply not just to mind mapping, but to any note-taking technique you use. If you try mind mapping and it doesn't work, you can always come back to these principles to see where things might be going wrong. So I can hear you asking, Emil, what are these principles? Well, I learned the first of these principles in my first year of medical school, and I didn't even realize how much it was holding me back. In my first year of medical school, I was fresh out of high school and I had no idea what I was doing. There there was so much content and in order to cope, I was frantically writing notes from my lectures, hoping to cover them all. But the problem was that even though I was sometimes able to get through all the content, if you asked me a week later what I had covered, I wouldn't really know and there were times where I forgot that I had covered the lecture at all. You might be a victim of this without even realizing it. Pause the video and think about something you took notes on last week and how much you actually remember about that topic. You might be surprised at how little you actually remember. So what are the root causes of these problems? Well, the first is that at the time I wasn't being intentional about why I was taking notes. When I was listening to the lectures, I was writing down lots of information, almost as if I was trying to make notes for me to refer back to in the future. But when I thought about this, this didn't really make much sense because I would always have the lecture notes to refer back to if I really needed to. And the internet has so many resources that teach the things we learn in medical school. Instead, what I realized is that I should have been taking notes for my learning. If I had approached my note taking in this way, I would have started thinking beyond what the lecturer was saying and asking myself why I was writing things down and what things were the most important for me to remember. Even when I was just typing my notes, doing this made my brain work harder to understand the topic deeply. And this instantly allowed me to remember content for much longer than before. This idea of your brain working harder is actually a good thing. And it's referred to as cognitive load and it's one of the most important things required for effective learning. The second principle is about the way that our memories work and this can actually help you in every single aspect of life. Every day you might travel to work or placement and pass hundreds of cars on your way there. But if I was to ask you what the number plate of a certain car was, there's very little chance that you'd actually remember it. But say that you were driving and two cars got into an accident in front of you, then you'd probably remember a lot about the model of the cars and even maybe their number plates. The thing is, our brains are taking in information all the time but it's filtering it and what we remember is the information that's relevant to us. The cars that we pass when nothing is happening are completely irrelevant. But as soon as our lives are possibly put into danger, we're likely to remember quite a lot about those cars. You might think that this only occurs in life-threatening situations, but that actually isn't true. For example, this is the reason why you're much more likely to remember someone's name or things about them if you find them attractive. This is also why if you have a favorite sport or TV show that's important to you, you're able to remember stats about certain players or lines word for word from the show. You'll know that you never had to do a flashcard to remember one of your favorite characters' iconic lines. At least I hope you haven't. The point in this is that when your brain assigns importance to something, it's much more likely to remember it. So how do we apply this to studying? Well, this is where mind mapping is such a powerful technique. Fundamentally, mind mapping is about making connections and finding the relationships between big ideas, concepts and details. When one idea has many meaningful connections coming out of it, it's much more likely that it will be important to you and that your brain will remember it. The key word here is meaningful because just creating a ton of connections will not create importance in your brain. You need to think beyond what a lecture slide or page of notes is telling you and evaluate which connections are most important to you. This is the process that people refer to as higher order learning. This will be different for everyone because everyone has different levels of existing 
existing knowledge going into studying a topic. For example, I know the symptoms of diabetes pretty well now that I'm a fourth year student, but for someone learning about diabetes for the first time, they might need to learn a little bit more about the pathophysiology of diabetes so that they can understand why the symptoms occur to make them more memorable. So now let me show you how I mind map and how you can supercharge these principles to learn massive amounts of content in short periods of time. The first part of creating a good mind map is deciding what you want to study. This means that in general, I know that in one two to three hour study session, I can usually finish the approach to one presenting complaint or the management of a group of conditions or two to three related conditions in complete detail. When you're starting out, your ability to tolerate high cognitive load will be a lot lower since you're just not used to it. What I recommend is starting with smaller mind maps and building your way up to bigger ones. In this video, I'll show you how I studied a presenting complaint, which is the painful red eye. This is a topic that I've actually already studied, but I think this will allow me to explain my thought process a lot better and I can show you the finished product that I created. To start, I'd like to direct myself by writing an outcome for what I want to achieve by the end of my study session. When I write this, I actually purposely try to avoid using words like understand, and instead I use words like evaluate and analyze because I want to think about the topic at an even deeper level. With this presenting complaint, I might write that my intention is to evaluate the importance of the different causes of a painful red eye. Say for example, I wanted to study management, I might write instead that my intention is to evaluate the key management options for a painful red eye. The next step is to collect keywords, and this is really just a process to help you keep the bigger picture in mind and to stop you from getting lost when you're in the content. In this topic, the keywords are essentially just the names of the conditions that I want to cover in the mind map. Now, this is when you start to learn about the topic. To start, I'm going to look at the first keyword on this list, which is acute angle glaucoma. And because I know a little bit about this topic already, I'm not going to refer to resources, but in reality, I probably would. What's more important here is the way that I'm thinking about that information that I'm learning and how I go about creating the mind map from that. So now that I'm looking at acute angle glaucoma, I'm thinking about my intention with creating this mind map, which was to evaluate why it's important in terms of a cause of a painful red eye. So here, starting with glaucoma, I might just, you know, briefly write down that one of the reasons that it's definitely important is that it's a red flag. It can cause blindness and it's very, very acute. So these are immediately some reasons as to why glaucoma might be an important cause of a red eye. And so then I might go further down this list and maybe I'll skip some of these first ones and I'll go down to, for example, subconjunctival hemorrhage. And so when I'm thinking about this hemorrhage now, this is quite different to glaucoma. It's not a red flag, but it is acute. So there are some similarities between these two conditions, but they're also very, very different in that you wouldn't be as worried about a subconjunctival subconjunctival hemorrhage. And essentially the process that I would go through would be to go through this list and continue to think about different reasons and similarities and differences that these conditions might share. As I go through this process, I realize that, oh, some of these conditions are actually red flags. And I might also realize that, oh, some of these are all infections and some of them are all affecting the outside of the eye, for example. There are a lot of different ways that you can think about this topic in terms of anatomical relation or the underlying etiology, or even how serious of a problem that condition is. As you think about all of these different things, you'll be able to put these conditions into little categories almost. And this is the process called chunking. The important thing about this process is that you start to think about as many different chunk structures as you can to kind of evaluate which one might be the best for you to understand the topic. In this case, I've already brought up a few of them here. So I might think about how a red eye could be something serious or not serious. Another chunk structure that I might be able to look at is the cause of a red eye that happens on by anatomical location. So the outside of the eye versus the eye itself. And for a chunk structure like this, I would be able to see that a lot of these conditions on this list maybe don't affect the eye itself, but affect things outside of the eye. So for example, preceptal cellulitis, orbital cellulitis, also um, there's herpes zoster, 
um, which also affects both the outside and the inside of the eye. There's ectropion and entropion, which affect the eyelashes. So all of these things then, I can start to group them and chunk them into different areas of my mind map. If I have this anatomical chunk though, I still want to compare it to the other chunk structures that I have. And I want to think to myself, is it better to think about the topic through the anatomical relationships of these conditions, or is it better to think about it through a serious versus not serious lens? When you start doing this, you realize that this is very difficult to do. And you realize that you have to look at all of these conditions as a whole. You can't just jump into the details for one condition, learn that, and then go to the next, because then you'll get overwhelmed with all the details and how they relate to each other. This actually allows you to get through content much, much faster because you're always looking at the most important information that you need in order to make your mind map. When you start comparing different chunk structures, you can also start thinking about which ones are more intuitive and which ones relate to you more and are more unique to your understanding of the topic. This is actually the mind map that I ended up with. And as you can see, I formed my own way of thinking about the topic, which I've arrived at by thinking about many different possibilities. With this topic, because there were so many conditions, I decided that for me, it was easier to think about it through anatomical relationships. So the outside of the eyes or the things that you could see on the surface versus things that are underneath or inside the eye that you couldn't necessarily see on the surface. This allowed me to break up the conditions into different parts. And it also gives me an idea of how to approach someone who has a red and painful eye, because I can just look at their eye and think about where the problem might be. And that will just be a certain part of this mind map. I am by no means a master at mind mapping, but it is so powerful because I created this mind map three months ago, reviewed it at home once, created a few flashcards and saw some of the conditions on placement. And I still remember all of it now. But the problem is this process takes a lot of practice and you won't be able to do it if you're always tired and procrastinating after placement. So watch this video to see how I'm able to study after placement, no matter how tired I am.